Welcome to this May Day webinar, Revolution, Ireland from Below, circa 1919 to 1923. This event is sponsored by the Irish Centre for Histories of Labour and Class, which is part of the Moore Institute. And thanks to John Cunningham, uh, who's the co-director of that uh, centre as ever for convening this event. My name is Daniel Carey. I'm director of the Moore Institute. Uh, we're both very grateful to David Kelly, who's Digital Humanities Manager in the Moore Institute for running the show behind the scenes. Uh, thank you again, David. So uh, looking very much looking forward to the discussion tonight. And uh, thanks again, John, over to you. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to NUI Galway to our online May Day seminar. Uh, and the welcome is on behalf of all of us at the Irish Centre for the Histories of Labour and Class at the Moore Institute. Uh, normally, uh, we'd be uh, in the Mechanics Institute in Middle Street with our friends in the Galway Trades Council uh, for an event like this. Uh, but I suppose we can look forward to being back in more convivial surroundings next year. In the meantime, here we are again on the World Wide Web. And thanks uh, to Dan Carey and to David Kelly for getting this uh, event up on the various media, Zoom, Facebook, uh, YouTube. Um, and now we have a lot to pack into the next 75 minutes, panel discussion, song and a book launch. Uh, but while you get settled, I'll say a few words myself about May Day, which we're marking a little bit uh, prematurely. That's before we get to the main topic, uh, which is the circumstances in Ireland uh, a century ago. Uh, I'm up on camera now, is that right, David? Uh, you are, yes. Yeah, I can be seen, I just can't see myself. So I was just wondering. Yeah, okay. Uh, so May Day has been an occasion of popular celebration for centuries, but as a specific labor and socialist holiday, it goes back to efforts to achieve de decent basic conditions for working people in the late 19th century. Internationally, the great cause of that era was the eight hour day. And it was in that regard that workers in Chicago mobilized in early May, 1886. During a demonstration in that city, a bomb exploded. Leaders of the Chicago eight hour day movement who were libertarian socialists, anarchists, uh, were framed for the act of terror and four of them uh, were executed. Um, the executions resonated around much of the world, and four years later, the Socialist International declared May Day a day of international uh, mobilization uh, by labor bodies. Cities where the first May Day uh, was marked in 1890 uh, uh, included Dublin, and the Eight Hour Day, um, as, well of the, as well as the extension of political rights, uh, were the key demands of the marchers in those early May days. It wasn't until the period of the struggle for independence, the period that we're talking about tonight, that May Day was marked in Ireland outside the major cities. In 1919, May Day was marked in Galway for the first time, one of more than 100 places where there were work stoppages and trade union marches in support of the socialist international call for the right of peoples to self-determination. Chewham, Balnasloe, Loch Ray, and most dramatically, Gort also had May Day marches in 1919 in this county. The effectiveness of the stoppage at that time, of the work stoppage, is attributable to the strength of trade unions in those years and should be seen in the context of the anti conscription strike a year earlier and the munitions boycott that we'll be talking about later. For much of the 20th century, of course, the great May Day demonstrations were associated with the Soviet Union, but it's notable, I think, that its origins were in the United States. So if you're settled in now, um, I'll introduce our panel and I'll do it in alphabetical order. First, Anne Bourne um, is a Professor Emerita of uh, Social Science at the University of Chester and uh, formerly chief editor of the Issues in Social Sciences series uh, for Chester Academic uh, Press. Widely published on globalization, poverty and crime, she is currently working on a biography of her father, Nixie Boren, who was a notable leader of the miners in Castle Comer, uh, County Kilkenny. Um, the second uh, panelist is uh, Terry Dunn, 
a scholar of rural and agrarian life and conflict. Uh, he's a graduate of NUI Galway and he earned a PhD from NUI Maynooth. His current projects include a podcast series called Peelers and Sheep, which I'll ask him about in a while, and uh, also a forthcoming collection of essays entitled Spirit of Revolution, Ireland from Below 1916 to 23, of which I'm a co-editor, uh, and others of our panellists are contributors. Um, we should be able to celebrate the launch of that uh, by next May Day, or maybe a little before. Uh, moving on uh, to our third panellist, uh, Moira Layden is the Assistant General Secretary of the ASTI, um, in which capacity she represents post-primary teachers on national and international bodies. During recent um, local history studies that she undertook at NUI Maynooth, uh, she researched communal life in Maharao, uh, County Sligo, and she's working on a book-length study of the community there. Uh, fourth uh, panellist is Peter Rigney. Uh, Peter was an industrial officer uh, of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions from 1980 to 2020. He has a PhD in history from Trinity College Dublin on the operations of the railway system during the emergency. He is assistant archivist of the um, um, Irish Railway Record Society. So that's our panellists. And I'll go to Terry Dunn uh, for the first uh, question. Terry, um, uh, in the title of this evening's talk, there's a question mark. Um, so the question is really, um, to what extent can it be said that there was a revolution in Ireland in the period we're discussing? I think you're uh, muted. You're muted. muted. Sorry. Uh, revolution is an abstract uh, concept we use to aid our understanding. So the first thing we need to do really to start off with is to define revolution. Um, and in doing so, we can draw on social science literature, uh, particularly the work of uh, Charles Tilley. And in that, revolution is defined in terms of multiple sovereignty and mass mobilization. Uh, multiple sovereignty is where a party splits into two, where you have two rival governments or administrations, both claiming to be the legitimate power in an area and both treated as such by significant sections of the population. Um, in the case of Ireland in this period, the Dáil and the Crown. Um, and then you have mass mobilisation. Uh, so multiple sovereignty and mass mobilisation are the two constitutive uh, elements of a revolutionary situation. Uh, not violence per se, as there are other violent processes of political change, such as uh, an invasion or a coup d'etat, and a revolutionary situation may be more or less revolutionary independently of it being more or less violent. Um, we have to distinguish as well between a revolutionary situation and a revolutionary outcome. Um, the revolutionary situation of multiple sovereignty and mass mobilization can exist without it, without there being a revolutionary outcome at the end of the day. And a revolutionary outcome we can define as to where there's a, not simply a change of government, um, but a significant process of, uh, of, of social change. And I believe um, that there was a significant process of uh, social change in early 20th century Ireland. 20% um, of farmland was redistributed in the 26 counties in the post-revolutionary period. Um, and when I say that, I mean large land holdings broken up and redistributed to smallholders, not just property deeds, formal ownership being transferred from tenants to landlords, which is a separate issue. Um, now, we did have that transfer of, of property deeds happening in the Free State period. Also, in 1916, one third of Irish farmers were still tenants, yeah? So the final settlement of the land question happened under the free state, not under the United, United Kingdom, which was a significant um, um, social transformation in my opinion. And certainly uh, if you date the revolution from, an, from earlier, if you go back as far as uh, 1879 and date it from the start of the land war, um, I think it underscores the significant social transformation that took place. Now, that may seem like a separate period, but there was still a live agrarian issue 
in the 1920s. And I'd argue that nationalism only became a popular force in rural Ireland from the land war onwards. So that was actually bound up with the same process and same period as 1913 to 1923 in, in, uh, in um, my opinion. And you end up there maybe with, you know, it's not 10 days that shook the world. It's something that's going on um, over decades. But that's not singular to the Irish case either. I mean, if you look at, say, uh, the same time as Ireland, you had the Mexican Revolution. And the Mexican Revolution, most of the fighting was done in the, uh, in the, in the, in the 1910s. But it was actually more the, the 1930s, 1940s that you had the uh, significant um, processes of, uh, of social reform, which were actually similar to what was going on in Ireland in some ways. Okay, thanks, Terry, um, uh, for that. Um, so that was um, kind of an overview. I suppose we want to take things to the local, perhaps, uh, now. So, uh, uh, and you've done detailed uh, research on uh, Castlecomer, which I think is your native place. Is that right? Yes. Um, and it was a distinctive place um, because of the presence there of a mining community. Can you tell us something about the locality? social relations and indeed mobilizations for social objectives there. Okay, um, the locality uh, corresponds to that area around Castle Comer uh, on the borders with Leash and Carlo, um, which corresponds to the Wanisford estate of 22,000 acres that had been held by that family from the 17th to the 20th century. Um, post the Land Wars and the Wyndham Land Act of 1904, uh, Richard Pryor Wanisford of the day um, sold most of his land to be distributed amongst his ex-tenants. Uh, but he kept control of the mines in the area and wasn't particularly as sympathetic to miners' demands. Now, the social relations I look at are those of the farmers, miners, carters and business people, including professionals such as priests, teachers and doctors, people who are very influential in the community. All shared, as I would say, an overall goal of independence uh, and participated in, uh, they had participations in the 11 IRA companies set up uh, in the North Kilkenny uh, Battalion uh, they participated in Sinn Féin clubs and Dáil courts, and all of which were formed to work in towards independence. With the exception, however, of one IRA company, the leadership came from the farming and business communities. Um, yet, so I say, notions of Irish independence were not necessarily the same for each group. Actions and decisions reflected the power imbalances between groups and did not always serve the interests of all. So the farmers had gained um, land ownership, had a positive association with successful organization. Um, but of the 12,522 farmers in the Kilkenny in Kilken County, a quarter of them approximately uh, had holdings of less than one acre, and the average farm size was 19 acres. So they were dependent on the mines uh, to supplement their earnings. However, they felt that land ownership gave them a status above that of the miners, um, uh, because they were not fully dependent on wage labor. Farmers, particularly in the hilly areas around Castlecomer, uh, had a lot of flexibility. They could hide arms, they could hold training sessions and meetings, and could keep generally out of sight of the RIC and the Black and Tans. The miners, on the other hand, there were about 500 to 600 miners working for the four remaining my pits on the Jarosine. Uh, Jaro 7, Vera, Rock and Montine, and one pit on the Skahana scene. There was a strong family 
um, mining traditions in the area. Uh, sons followed the former, their fathers into the mines at age 14, and they developed a very strong culture of solidarity based on dangerous uh, working conditions underground and a lot of socialization overground. Uh, they tended to also intermarry with other mining families. There were many attempts made to organize in 19th and 20th century mostly unsuccessful because they depended mainly on outside organizers to help them in this business. But by 1918, they organized under the Irish Transport and General Workers Union and became very influenced by the ideas of James Connolly and Jim Larkin. So socialism and nationalism appealed to many miners. They brought with them uh, the skills to the War of Independence, their skill with explosives, and many of them, for example, smuggled out materials uh, from the mines for both uh, company and brigade use. The carmen, there were about 300 carmen whose interests didn't necessarily coincide with those of the miners. They had independence, good earnings, ability to travel distances and carry ideas, they knew how to fight their corner, uh, using strikes and disruptive tactics when needed. They were regarded as expensive by Wanisford, who fought for a railway to come into the area uh, in order to be able to um, take coal out of the area to national level and beyond. Uh, they had deep local knowledge and good means of transport. Um, now the businesses, many businesses were located in the town of Castlecomer, um, but there was a network of pubs and um, shops spread throughout the collieries. Many business owners had a farming background. They were ardent supporters of land league movements. They were facilitators of Gaelic league activities. They had money educated their children sometimes to degree level. Um, they were often served as mediators uh, in mining disputes. They were confident uh, uh, in, of their status in the community and often used the, the tool of bo boycott against the RIC and the Black and Tans. They also supplied the IRA companies with provisions when, um, when they were needed. So they had quite a stake in, um, in gaining independence, let's say. In the meantime, for those who led, and many of the business community were leaders in uh, the IRA companies, um, they were very influential in planning operations. In terms of professionals, Father McNamara, the, the curate of Moaning Row, for example, was, was actively an IRA supporter, whereas Canon McNamara of the town was anti. Um, so you had teachers who fostered the culture of Irishness, the language, um, the history, and anti-Britishness. All participated in disruptive actions such as ambushing, trenching roads, burning or attacking RIC barracks, and each brought particular skills and strengths to the fight for independence. Okay. Thank you, Anne. Thanks. Okay, uh, we'll be back uh, on some to develop some of those points uh, later uh -huh. on. Yeah. Um, I should say to our audience um, that if you have questions for any of the panelists you can uh, type them into q a uh, if you're watching on facebook uh, you can put it into the comments there and they'll reach the panelists um, from that uh, route um, so i'm going on now to um to um uh, moira uh, uh, north sligo moira moira uh, i'd imagine was quite uh, different to north kilkenny um i know you've been researching the area centred on Maharao, uh, which is 
a notable area which includes the Lissadale estate. Uh, your focus is on the organisation of agricultural labourers. Can you tell us something about that? Indeed, I guess Garma, I guess GE have got bit of more in honour of that on Shah August. I'll see Logan uh, got the ruddy and my mate Kanshvi by Simog of Freshen. So good evening, everybody, and it's a great honour to be here. I feel a little bit out of my depth among these erudite historians, but um, I suppose really coming at it from the local level, I actually was born in the a long time ago, shall we say, uh, 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 just after the mid-century in uh, Maharao and um, uh, uh, always had, a, uh, indeed, many members of my family always had a great interest in history. For those of you who don't know the geography, Maharao is the peninsula which is um, literally between, shall we say, Drumcliff and Bondoran, basically, Drumcliff uh, 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 and Cliffany. Uh, and what makes Maharao distinctive is the fact that uh, it was a very, very typical part of a rural congested district of the west of Ireland. But more significantly, it had uh, the Gorbuth estate, uh, which uh, was within the parish of Maharao. Uh, and the Gorbuth estate, as you know, is the home of the, the uh, iconic uh, and great revolutionary and labour uh, leader, Constance Markovich, but also of her sister, Eva Gorbuth, and of course, that much neglected figure who, who really deserves much more serious historical research, uh, her brother, Sir Jocelyn Gorbuth. So my research is focused on, uh, uh, as, um, as, as John has says, I completed an undergraduate diploma course in how to study, how to study local history, which is a really good title for a course in the news, and I, I would highly recommend it. And for the dissertation, uh, um, we, I looked at communal life in Maharao during World War I, and it really galvanised me. Uh, I suppose working in a trade union and, and being a member of a trade union a tip to all of my work in life, it really galvanised me to start to think about history from below. Uh, um, and, and one of the areas which uh, um, I felt really had been completely under, understudied, and in fact it was rather hard to research, uh, was the whole area of labour, the mobilisation of the rural proletariat. Uh, and indeed, it would be fairer and more sociologically accurate to say the, the, the lumpen proletariat. So the basic thesis of my, uh, um, uh, uh, the, basic the, basic the basic premise of my presentation is that the story of the mobilisation of rural labour in this uh, Maharao area is actually the story of the Transport and General Workers Union post-1916. Uh, so a little bit of background data uh, first. Uh, and that's a quite an extraordinary story of rapid mobilisation, uh, a hugely significant uh, uh, nationwide, uh, uh, community-wide indeed, uh, um, success of trade union action, collective action, and then suddenly uh, towards by 22, 1922, 1923, it not so much petered out as the fact that it imploded. And that's an extraordinary story in the history of the Transport Union. So the Transport Union, as you know, was founded in uh, uh, 1909. The, one of the very first, I think Sligo was the fourth branch to uh, emerge in 1911. Uh, it was supported by the Trades Council, the Sligo Trades Council, which preceded it by about 10 years or so by the United Irish League. Uh, uh, and uh, um, other organizations, including the Ancient Order of Hibernians. Uh, the, uh, from the get-go, the Sligo branch of the Union was a radical militant active branch. Uh, by March 1912, there was a three-week a three -week strike on the docks over cattle money, which dockers were entitled to for handling uh, live cattle, uh, and it was refused. And uh, P.T. Daly, one was one of the, the great early transport union organizers, came down from Liberty Hall and worked with uh, the local uh, secretary, uh, um, John Lynch, who incidentally, uh, and I still haven't got to his pedigree, but as, as I understand, he was born in Maharana, whether he lived his life there is a different matter, uh, but he was born, uh, he was the great uh, uh, Larkin of, of, of Sligo. Uh, literally uh, 12 months later, in January 1913, uh, uh, there was an eight, in March 1913, there was an eight week strike. It prefigured the Dublin lockout, an eight week strike, and again on the docks in Sligo. Uh, and this was extraordinary. I mean, it really galvanized the, the, the political life of, of the, it galvanized the political life of the town, indeed the county. 
and was noted by many uh, labour historians as being a highly significant strike, strike in terms of Irish labour mobilisation. Uh, what was actually of interest during that strike when I come to my later part, Sir Jocelyn Gore Booth, who, would, who could, one would describe now as a Christian uh, um, socialist almost, he was very influenced by Ruskin, uh, by Tolstoy, uh, and by those kind of, shall we say, uh, uh, humanitarian ideals. Actually, what was interesting was, and I, I found out all of this through the, uh, the, the, the great uh, um, prevention newspapers, the Sligo Champion in particular, but during that eight week strike, or Booth supplied potatoes to the strikers' families. And indeed, there's a lovely memorial from the Transport Union uh, in, in, his, uh, in the archives in Belfast, uh, the Gore Booth archives, uh, containing thanks from the Transport Union for keeping the families alive during this period. And what's more significant as well, that the resolution of the strike was facilitated by his agent, Mr. T.A. Cooper. Uh, so uh, that was the background, I suppose, trade unionism in Sligo, uh, uh, in Sligo Town. And of course, the other branch of the union in Sligo in, Sli in County Sligo was in Ballisadair, where you had um, the, the flour mills, uh, and in Kaluni and Ballymote, where you had the, where you had the, the railway workers. So uh, what what uh, so what happened in Maharao, an area which even to this day there isn't a village. It was a completely rural area, and yet. Uh, uh, um, by, by the 1920s, uh, uh, it had a branch which was uh, the second largest in Sligo. So essentially what happened was most of the Mohara, as I said, it was an extraordinarily, uh, it was described as one of the poorest uh, by one of the MPs in the House of Commons as one of the poorest areas in, in one of the poorest counties uh, in Ireland, uh, uh, and all of Sligo, of course, was in the congested district board, and Maharao, being on the, the coastline, was particularly uh, uh, impoverished. So, uh, 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 so essentially, they, they, there was no work, uh, uh, and the main employer was Maharao and one or two other Protestant farmers who were not landlords per se, uh, as such at all, uh, but, but uh, Gore Booth was a huge employer. Uh, he employed up to 300 people on his um, on his estate uh, between factor between um, farming, horticulture, uh, a, a sawmill, a furniture factory, a gas works, etc. Uh, so he was the biggest employer in the area. So essentially to, to and I'm conscious of time because uh, it's such an interesting story one gets lost and it's important to get the jigsaw pieces in place. Essentially the transport union uh, uh, after the 1913 lockout, it was a severely weakened union at a recruiting meeting in Cork, Walter Partridge uh, 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 with strong associations with Sligo. He, uh, at a 1915 uh, uh, recruiting meeting for members, uh, he bemoaned the fact that out of the 5,000 members uh, um, in Ireland, uh, 2,700 had, en had enlisted in the British forces. And yet by the year 1920, the union had 120,000 members, an extraordinary growth over five years. So what actually happened? Well, essentially what happened was the war. I mean, the war was the great uh, disruption uh, uh, at the, of, of the time. Uh, jury, uh, increased employment during the war led to uh, more workers, and, uh, but also what drove them to join unions when they had the bitter experience of 1913 of being locked out for being members of unions? Well, essentially what drove them to join the unions was uh, post uh, January 1916, halfway through the war, things began to go very badly wrong. The hardships of war began to hit the prices, the food, pr food prices rocketed, they trebled in some instances, and of course the profiteering was absolutely immense. And this led to very, very significant worker militancy. Uh, uh, and they, they, they began to join the unions, but what really uh, mobilized the workers to join the unions was the fact that uh, the British government, or the government as it was of the day, in order to stabilize production had to set up arbitration boards, and Peter of course would be very familiar with this and no doubt will mention it later, but to stabilize production in the face of rising union militancy uh, and shortages of manpower, they set up arbitration boards forcing the employers to negotiate with workers in terms and condition. And of course, the workers flocked to join. And as that eminent uh, labor historian, Emmett O'Connor said, what was an unconnected, unorganized wage movement became an organized wages movement. And the transport union literally grew like topsy. Uh, it absorbed the local uh, labor unions and the local labor leads. 
But what really put the, the, the shall we say, the, the dynamic behind the growth of the transport union at this time was the fact that an arbitration board was brought in for agricultural labourers. In January 27, 1917, uh, the Corn Production Act uh, introduced compulsory tillage. If you had more than 10 acres, 10% had to go under the plough and, and further 5% in 1918. Uh, uh, but the problem was the shortage of manpower. There simply wasn't enough uh, uh, um, workers willing to endure the hard life and the appalling pay and long hours of the agricultural labourers. So in September of that year, the government set up the Agricultural Wages Board, which was the arbitration board uh, for the agricultural labourers, which set a maximum of a 60 hour working week and minimum wages for a whole series of agricultural workers, including milkmaids. Uh, which again uh, uh, is really important to bring the, the, the women's participation in. And the agricultural workers across the, the country flocked to join the union, so much so that by 1920, 60% of the transport union's membership was agricultural labourers. One of the big attractions of the transport union for the agricultural labourers was the syndicalist, uh, shall we say, culture and philosophy of mass uh, uh, class solidarity, direct action, uh, uh, boycotting, uh, 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 a tendency or, uh, to violence, and very much the technique which would have been used in the land wars prior prior to the First World War. So in March 19, in March 1917, the Sligo Champion reported that the inaugural meeting of the Maharao branch, formerly the Maharao Labourers Union, uh, co-opted into the uh, was co-opted into the. Um, uh, the the uh, the transport union and John Lynch had a very moving uh, um, statement uh, which I used uh, previously in a in a piece. He said it was inspiring and hopeful to see such large numbers of youths present at the meeting. They are the coming men, Ireland's hope. And believe it or not, uh, a women's branch of the transport union was set up in late 1918. Though I haven't been able in the parish, I haven't been able to find out too much about that yet. By June 1918. In a small country area, the branch had 130 members. It was the second largest of five in Sligo. Um, it, uh, its first, shall we say, uh, encounter was with uh, a local farmer, uh, uh, Henry, uh, who, who basically uh, dismissed the union man and, and, and um, what's the word, replaced him with a non-union man. Yeah. Moira, I'll have to cut across you there. Uh, we'll come back to this point in a few minutes. Um, I'm just trying to to manage the time. As you managed, yeah, uh, you managed to. You're trying to rush me on. Well, I get to the Lissadell bit. Yeah, yeah. Go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So anyway, the transport union was growing uh, uh, solidly, uh, and then in it's 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 the zenith of the transport union's organisation came in June of 1920. And essentially what happened was that Gore Booth was not paying the, uh, the, rate, the wage rate that was arbitrated by the, 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 the arbitration board. So the transport union in Lissadell decided to go on strike. It had a three week strike which caused uh, extraordinary consternation in the newspapers because Gore Booth, of course, was a very eminent person in many regards. The strike was characterized by, shall we say, the, the pageantry which accompanied an awful lot of the union's uh, political activities at the time, parades, marching bands, fife and drums. There was actually plans drawn up for, a, for the creation of a Soviet on the Lissadell estate. And in the private diaries of Aideen Gore Booth, uh, she wrote about the fact that, a ma uh, that they entered the house, uh, forced all the servants to get out and told her mother, Lady Gore Booth, that the red flag would be flying over uh, the big house in Lissadell. So it was quite an extraordinary situation. Eventually, the, the, the dispute was resolved by a compromise situation. The workers had wanted uh, 30 shillings for a 45 hour week instead of the 26 shillings, six pence uh, for the 50 hour week that we're currently doing. So a compromise solution was arrived at of 30 shillings for a 48 hour week. And very significantly, the non-union workers were dismissed. And this, I think, was also part of the bargain. So finally, I can talk about the next big John, where I'm sorry for going on a bit in terms of the legacy. I'll be able to talk about, yeah. shall we say, the implosion dimension, because I've given yes. you the, the kind of the rise, and I'll give you the fall later on. So yes. My apologies for going on a little bit. Okay, right. Thanks, Maria. Very interesting. Almost a Lissadell Soviet. But... <laughs> anyway, um, I'll go to Peter uh, now. Peter, your research is... Uh, 
national in scope, focusing on the munitions boycott by transport workers, especially on the railways. And we'll be coming back to that later uh, as well uh, in the book launch. Uh, but uh, Peter, you might uh, tell us a little bit about that um, uh, dispute. OK, John, th thanks for the invitation. In fact, it's international scope because the dispute arose from solidarity action by London dockers to prevent the loading of uh, 18 pounder cannons to support the Russians against the Soviet army. Uh, the dockers uh, blacked the ship, went to Ernest Bevan, who got support for it. And following on that, J.H. Thomas, General Secretary of the NUR, put a motion to his executive um, to instruct the members not to handle munitions for export. Now, J.H. Thomas wouldn't be regarded as being a, a paragon of international solidarity. But at the time, there was a, a fear throughout the Labour movement that Winston Churchill wanted to drag Britain into another war against Soviet Russia. So shortly thereafter, um, a number of two active trade unionists in Dublin applied the lessons of solidarity, trade union solidarity with London to their own situation. One was Michael Donnelly, a member of the Transport Union, who was a deep sea docker, um, a casual docker. And when a ship came in with lorries for the British Army called the Anadoret Boog, uh, he went up to Liberty Hall and suggested that the ship be blacked and that if the um, if the British worked the ship, that all all uh, British military traffic would be boycotted. The source for that is in William O'Brien Fort the Banners Go. Following on from that, uh, an ex-Irish volunteer who'd been dismissed after 1916 and got a job in the Dublin and Southeastern Railway, a guy called Christopher Moran, was asked to go to the Admiralty Wharf in Dunleary um, as a guard on a train to pick up 22 wagons of munitions to go around to Houston, Kings Bridge as it was then, to go southwards. Now you'll notice the difference between dockers and railwaymen immediately. Dockers control the, the quayside. They can be replaced by troops for unloading. The second ship um, was sent to the Admiralty Wharf in Dunleary and the name kind of gives a hint as to who owned it. Uh, and, and the dispute then spread to the railways in June of 1920. Within a week, it had spread to the, no the North Wall where dockers were employed by the London and Northwestern Railway and they were dismissed because they refused to handle uh, a crate of pistols due for the Dublin Metropolitan Police. It then spread to the railway proper uh, when uh, train crews began to refuse to carry uh, British br uh, British military armed British military parties, and it spread throughout the south and west in June. Now, there's an, an awful lot of complex toing and froing because the British government took over all the railways in World War One under war emergency powers uh, in Britain in 1914 and in Ireland in 1916. So the railway companies were getting paid regardless of what traffic they ran. And initially, they were reluctant to dismiss employees um, who, who refused to carry traffic, which normally was absolutely uh, a cardinal sin among railway management, because the railways had seen off a strike by the NUR in 1911 and, and had virtually broken the union. So in June and in July, the pressure came on railway management to adopt a more robust uh, attitude to people who refused to handle traffic and a plan was afoot for a policy of mass dismissals. Now the railway uh, network was a lot wider then than it is now. The trains went to places like Skibbereen, Dingle, Ennistymon, Bortonport, Clifton, Clonus, etc, etc, etc. So if the railway system collapsed, the food distribution system collapsed and this is one of the reasons that brought a strike to the end. However, the plan by the companies to adopt a more robust approach uh, was given a setback in July when the squad in the person of Jim Slattery and Paddy Daly, and you do not want Paddy Day Daly paying a call on you in his squad role, arrived in Westland Row Station and shot Frank Brook, manager of the Dub chairman of the Dublin Southeastern Railway. So at, from that stage, the willingness of the companies to dismiss people uh, diminished radically, as one might imagine. Uh, and, and the government put increasing pressure on the railway companies uh, to dismiss staff. And a, a sort of a stalemate um, occurred until the autumn. And if you go to the diaries of Mark Sturgis, who was a castle administrator, in the autumn he said, um, 
I am put in charge of a committee to strangle the Irish Railways. And gradually a policy of dismissals was imposed. A policy of last mass line closures was, was imposed. To step back a bit, the British in July, June, July 1920, would have assumed that the response of Irish trade unions to dismissal would have been the Larkinite one of an injury, of, of, an injury to one is, is an offence to all. That was not the case. The strike leadership, because it was unofficial from the point of view of the NUR and the Train Drivers Union as that, the strike leadership was taken over by the Irish, Irish Trade Union Congress. Now, I worked in Congress for 40 years, and it is, I, can, I can assure you it is absolutely unknown for Congress to take over the running of a dispute. However, the Congress took over the running of the dispute and set up a, a munitions of war fund, which collected roughly five million in today's money. And the instruction was given, if somebody gets sacked, let them be sacked and the fund will pay them. And that means the vast majority of non-train operating staff were kept on the company's books. So things got uh, tougher in, in the autumn and winter. And as in the weekend after Bloody Sunday and Kilmichael, uh, it was quite apparent that there was, you know, the British were prepared to up the game. Um, martial law was introduced in the martial law area, as we know. What is less known is there was a statutory instrument brought in that would enable the military to direct railway traffic in, in, in a particular area. This would have put the prospect of tra refusing train crews being put before a court martial. So there was a conference of the NUR in Dublin in December to basically call off the dispute in exchange for a no victimization policy. And what is not generally realized that the man who proposed that before the conference took place a couple of days before, uh, a locomotive driver in Waterford in Lismore on his way home from work was shot by a sentry. And the man who proposed the motion to resume work would have, would have known that guy. Uh, what, what was the engine behind the dispute? Well, it's very difficult at this remove to work it out, but there was a fair amount of infiltration of the railway unions by the IRA and by the IRB. So I'll give you two pen pictures. One is Thomas Maguire, um, by this stage a boilerman in Dublin Corporation. He had been sacked after 1916 from his job as a fireman on the Midland Great Western Railway. But what he doesn't say in his military service pension was that he was branch secretary of ASLA up to that time. So he had excellent contacts and excellent union contacts. And then if we go to Mallow, there's a guy called Frank Dempsey, who was an organizer in Aslef. And Aslef at that stage were busy poaching most of the locomotive members from the NUR. We know Frank Dempsey was a Sinn Féin chairman of Mallow Urban District Council. And we know from the archives that he applied for and got special leave without pay to um, go to America with De Valera in 1920. And in the best tradition of industrial relations, he came back in 1922, apologizing for slightly overstaying his leave and looking for his job back, which he got. So this was a, a, a major dispute. It was a dispute that was highly organized. It was a dispute where the leadership of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions substituted for the union leadership. Um, and it was a dispute where Thomas Johnson and William O'Brien showed that they'd learned the lessons of the Limerick Soviet, that if you want to take on the might of the British, You've got to have a fund and a structure to do so. That's why the dispute lasted as long as it did. One of the two of the instances I, I raise in the book, because quite often Irish historians distract themselves with what ifs. I don't believe in the use of what ifs except as a parlour game. But there were two other munitions disputes. One was in Holland in uh, autumn 1944, when the Dutch government in exile called, caused a railway strike. And the Germans retaliated. Uh, by imposing a ban on food import, on food transport in the company. And Size Inquart, who was the girl lighter of Holland, said, either the railwomen go back to work or the Dutch people will starve. And the Dutch people starved. Uh, secondly, in 1951-52, uh, railwomen and dockers in France and in, in Algeria mounted an attempt at a boycott of shipments to Indochina. And that was suppressed by mass dismissals and by the shooting of strikers. And the prefect of the port of Marseille boasted that the CGT, which we would see as, a, if you like, a very strong icon of French militant trade unionism in the port of Marseille, had been decapitated. So that's it, in a nutshell, the munitions strike of 1920. Thank you. Peter. 
thanks. We'll be coming back. Um, I have a question or two, and there's one or two coming in uh, from the audience. Uh, so if you do want to um, ask a question, uh, type it into the uh, Q and A uh, there. Uh, so I suppose we're seeing um, some of the um, cause the, the causes of the um, social unrest that uh, uh, underpinned uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, revolution, as uh, Terry described uh, the, the the circumstances at the outset. I'm going to go back to Terry uh, now and. Um, Terry, um, fairly briefly uh, at this time, um, uh, um, you, there's, you're doing a podcast series at the moment about this period in Ireland, uh, which also treats elements of the international context. Can you tell us a little bit about it? You have interesting material about agrarian mobilizations, both by labourers and small farmers on that podcast. Um, thanks, John. Uh, well, there's a, a tendency in the imagined uh, Irish past to, to kind of subsume the whole rural population into this undifferentiated category of peasants. And the, uh, I shouldn't uh, probably be spending time slagging people off. It's a fine museum, but the Museum of Country Life in Mayo would be an example of that. Uh, but in fact, in uh, rural Ireland 100 years ago, there were very different classes and social strata and several contending different movements um, based on those classes. So you had the uh, Irish Farmers Union, which represented larger farmers in their capacities, in their capacity as employers, um, but, but would also have had concerns over more kind of what we now see as contemporary concerns over global trade and imports from Canada, um, over price cartels, um, over government regulations. Uh, you also had the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, which maybe as much as half of its members, um, 50,000 50, people would have been uh, agricultural workers, yeah. And um, that's the largest occupational category. I mean, the next largest was Dockers, which is, comes in about four, four or 5,000. and. As well as that, we have to remember that um, in addition to farm labourers, there would have been people working in agri processing or people who are working as in transport or logistics or actually exporting uh, agricultural uh, products. And um, so you had that labour movement based on the land. And you also had the, uh, the, the, the cattle drives, particularly in the spring of 1920 um, among small farmers often uh, generally but not exclusively on the uh, on the east connacht plain and it was that was uh, among people who didn't have economic holdings basically um were had farms that were that were too small um for for them to make a a a, a, a living out of now um i actually framed the podcast around the agrarian um for a number of reasons because it's the main industry um, of the Irish past, um, but also because it allows a wider vista. Um, so I, I will be moving in a different direction and looking at contemporary environmental issues um, in the next few episodes, like the spread of zoonotic diseases such as COVID and the relationship between that, the loss of biodiversity through the expansion of plantation agriculture and factory farms. Um, but uh, the first six episodes looked at the hidden histories of the Irish Revolution that we're talking about tonight, and as well as um, talking about rural labour and agrarian mobilisation um, and counter mobilisation in the form of the Irish Farmers Union. I also tried to put the Irish Revolution into a global context by looking at where the Irish regiments of the British Army were stationed in 1919 and 1920 and 1921, um, particularly the, the Leinster Regiment. Um, which was the last of the Southern regiments that were disbanded in 1922 to see combat. Um, it was involved in suppressing a, uh, an agrarian revolt um, a very, in a very confirmish context um, in Southwest India in August 1921. Uh, And I'd say, just as regards the Irish regiments, um, 
there's a lot of talk nowadays about openness and pluralism and maturity and outward lookingness in uh, our memory of this period. Yeah. And maybe we should find a way of memorializing the people who died at the hands of Irish soldiers in British uniform in India and lots of other places in this period. Um, so I'll leave it with that. Or maybe I won't because John still ha hasn't come in there. Sorry. Um, sorry, there we are. Um, I'm going back to Peter now. A, a number of questions have come in for Peter um, and uh, I'm not sure we're going to be able to get to them all. Um, uh, Pat McCarthy uh, asks, were all the railway men that were dismissed in 1920 reinstated? So you might address that. But I suppose uh, the question I really wanted to ask uh, was the um, uh, about the impact of the munitions boycott. Uh, can you assess its impact as far as the broader military and political struggle of the um, of the period was concerned? Um, fairly briefly. Okay, uh, Pat McCarthy's question: All railwaymen were, reinst were were reinstated later on the Great Northern Railway because of the political and sectarian implications of Ulster. There, the NUR branches had passed many motions pledging support for the government. Um, there was a, a body of men held out till 1922 by the Great Northern Railway. And you can follow this in the reports of the Irish Labour Party and Trade Union Congress, which are online. In the, in the south and west of the country, from the staff ledgers and from the reminiscences of locomotive drivers, all were reinstated. That's absolutely the case. Um, in relation to mobility, you, you cannot underestimate the unreliability of motor transport in that period. Uh, the fact that most people didn't know how to drive um, and the fact that helpfully the British War Disposals Board had sold off most of the decent lorries in 1919, leaving uh, the British in, in Ireland with what would be technically known as the crap. So. The, the British were, if you like, to use the phrase of Hammer Greenwood at the Cabinet, stuck to the ground. He said, we will never succeed while the IRA are mobile and while we are stuck to the ground. And General McCready put it more delicately when he said, uh, the only units that are mobile are the cavalry. Um, this meant two things. Firstly, it meant that in many cases, officers were put in the embarrassing position of ha having to prove to drivers and guards that they were unarmed, in which case they would be carried. And paradoxically, one of the safest places for a British soldier to be between June and December 1920 was unarmed on a train because train attacks didn't start until 1921. And it would have undermined the whole, if you like, passive or civic resistance aspect of the munitions strike if unarmed troops traveling on a train were attacked. So it had a huge impact on army mobility. Um, it's the famous phrase, as McCready said, it disrupted campaigning for the best part of the year. The, the preferred mode of campaigning for the British was to, to drive columns through affected areas. That would involve, say, taking troops from Fermoy by train to say the likes of Bantir or Mill Street and driving them across the mountains to meet up with columns who would have been brought by train from Cork to McCroom, backed up by cavalry. They simply didn't have the lorries to be able to do that. So it, it, it stuck the British to the ground. Okay, uh, thank you, Peter. OK, uh, I'll go back to Moira now, uh, um, again, uh, briefly uh, this time um, with regard to the ITGWU in Maharao. Did uh, it improve, did their involvement uh, in the union uh, improve the position of the Maharao labourers? Sorry, John. Uh, yes, it did. In the short term, it most certainly did improve their position. Uh, they got their, they got their, what do you call it? They got their uh, 45 hour week uh, for, sorry, there's a lot of noise going on here. Sorry, one moment, please. Girls, I told you I'm going to be Yeah. yeah. I'm terribly sorry about we that. We can't it's hear any background noise. It's fine. Yeah. That's one of the difficulties of Zoom. I do apologize. Yes, they did in the short term. They got they got their wage, they got their wage increase, and they got their work, uh, they got their working hours reduced. Uh, however, 
uh, post uh, the, the, the only way I was, uh, and I have to point out, John, um, I, I, the, the, the COVID put a complete halt to my research, so I haven't got as far as I would have liked, but I was able to look at the, um, the, the, the financial records of the transport union, uh, and you can see the decline of the Maharao branch in financial terms. In 1918, uh, uh, it had bigger dues actually than Sligo Town. It was paying over sixty pounds in remittances to the head office a year, compared to fifty-five pounds for the Sligo branch. Uh, in 1920, they were paying eighty-eight pounds, quite extraordinary. I think they had probably had hundred and seventy members at that stage. Uh, but by 1922, two years later, their remittances was only twenty-two pounds, and most significantly, and this is really an area of research which has to be absolutely gone into by myself in much greater detail. Their, their founder uh, member and their secretary, uh, uh, Bernard Meehan, actually from the same town land as myself in Maharao, he was no longer named as the branch secretary. And uh, um, I, I, I am fascinated to discover what would have happened to him. So um, by 1923, there was no remittances at all going back to Liberty Hall from, from um, Maharao. Um, what, what was interesting uh, in looking at the Gorbut papers uh, in Prony, and as you know, that's where most of them are stored, uh, as Sir Jocelyn, uh, as we were brought up in our early days to call him, he was a fantastic letter writer, uh, as indeed all of these people were, and so much of their lives was available through their private correspondence. But absolutely nothing at all mentioned about the agricultural labour striking. This is in contrast to the fact that he had quite an extensive correspondence with his agents as regards the strike of the railway workers on his, he, had a, he probably had the largest share in the Sligo Donegal railway line, which passed through in the Skillen. And there was quite a lot of stoppages and sabotage and uh, all sorts of, uh, uh, um, should we say, um, resistance going on there. And he was very annoyed about this and wrote several letters with very, very strict directives to his agent as to how to intervene, but absolute silence around the agricultural workers. And I think he actually, his cult, his political outlook was paternalistic. And I think he may have felt extremely offended by the fact that the people whose hand, whose father's hands he had fed during the famine of the eighties took again him. Uh, and there's just one final piece, John, from the archives that I was able to root out. Uh, and, and this, again, in a way, symbolizes the demise of the, the, the union and indeed the labor activity. It's dated from the 4th of July, 1930. It was um, uh, an instruction to his uh, farm manager. And he says that um, to farm, forestry and dairy workers, in the event of any dispute regarding wages, hours of employment, uh, or any other matter. There is to be no stoppage of work. Negotiations are to be carried out in a business-like manner as between employer and employees. And in the event of disagreement, the Ministry of Commerce will be asked to arbitrate, see signed copy. In other words, the transport, the, agri the, the agricultural labor's uh, political voice in the form of the transport union had at that stage gone completely off the scene. And we've seen that from other research and agricultural labor's so the legacy, I'm afraid, was very, very poor. Uh, and I think what will be what will be interesting would be to find out what actually happened to the leading lights. Did they like? Uh, did they? Did they? Um, did they like the losing side on the civil war? Did they? Did they eventually have to im up immigrating or whatever? So maybe that's for another day, John. Yeah. Thanks, Moria. Thanks, Moria. Um, I'll go back to Castle Comer now and uh, uh, to um, Anne Boren. Um, there, there's, um, I suppose, um, there was, um, how did the mobilization of this particular period, uh, 1918 to 22, 23, differ from uh, other periods of, um, uh, 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 of social mobilization in the community, uh, of, of labor militancy in, in the, in the, in the, um, in the um, it, before and since? Well, Castle Comer uh, probably has a name for uh, for having a certain amount of rebelliousness, um, John. Um, and uh, if we think about the territory, uh, the it was the old uh, stomping ground of the O'Brennan clan, and they fought once for tooth and nail to the courts. Um, to try and retain their lands right back in the 17th century. 
Um, they also made a nuisance of themselves on the on the estate lands that they regarded as still their own. Um, so throughout history, they participated, for example, in the rebellion of 1641, um, when the Wallaces are forced to flee the country and they, the estate was taken back briefly for a time. They, in um, the 1978 rebellion, for example, the miners from Dunan joined Father Murphy's um, troops, uh, Croppy Boys, um, when they marched into Kilkenny to take on Asquith's troops. And the miners helped to lay waste to the big house and also to uh, Castlecomer town. Um, so uh, when it came to the 19th century, you had both miners and farmers active in anti-tight movements, very militant they were, and also participating in the Whitefeet movements. Miners reacted very strongly, for example, to attempts to reform um, the mining system uh, to deep mining because it caused widespread unemployment um, despite their awful living conditions and working conditions of the time, condemned by numerous reports. Um, they were often blamed themselves for uh, creating their own conditions, being feckless of drinking too much, having too many children, etc. And they often hit back at incomers and the police, uh, sometimes quite violently. They were frequently manipulated by master colliers and by middlemen within the landlord system. Um, so the whole area I see in up to the 19th century was seen, particularly the beginning of 19th century, as a dangerous territory. Both tight collectors and troops feared to, uh, the troops feared to move in at night time. Um, tight collectors were afraid to go and collect tight. What was different in the later mobilization periods? I think um, the miners, for example, expected more through their unionization from independence. Um, they, they, however, made very little he headway in their battle for better wages and conditions, as Wandersford was quite intransigent, uh, particularly in relation to strike. So the miners participated um, very actively with IRA activities uh, during the War of Independence, such as the burning of the RIC barracks and the Coolborn ambush bush that took place outside of Castlecomer. Yet their work-based battles um, were not supported by the IRA. And I'll give some examples of that. Uh, for example, the Coolborn ambush was the 19th of June 1921. Um, this directly threatened miners' livelihoods because Wonnesford had said he would close the mines if the mines were attacked in any way. Um, and the whole neighbourhood depended on miners' wages. Um, however, the leadership at, at brigade level felt that some big token action was needed to showcase their contribution to the War of Independence. And so they attacked a convoy of explosives guarded by the RIC and Black and Tans, destined for the Vera mines. Uh, the ambush failed dismally uh, due to a myriad of communication and organizational problems, and two people died. Uh, a second example I'd give is in September 1921, when miners went on strike because their wages had been slashed by Wandersford uh, as a result of the withdrawal of wartime subsidies. And they marched into Kilkenny carrying a red flag where speeches were made uh, threatening to take over the mines uh, and bring them under miners' control. Uh, the miners then kidnapped two mine managers and kept them in a secret place. Wanisford, unusually you would have expected, called on the IRA for help. 
um, and they interviewed mine leaders, mine leaders in order to try and find out where the mine managers were. Eventually, the strike went to arbitration and the managers were released unharmed about two months later. Um, but the IRA did not bring their powers of coercion to bear on the miners' behalf in any way. They claimed that there was too much at stake for them to take sides. A third example is that of the aerial uh, ropeway sabotage, and here the carters were involved. Wanisford got his railway, and it was extended to, deer, to the Deer Park mine, where the aerial, an aerial ropeway carrying coals from all the different pits could be loaded directly onto the train and carried out of the county. So on the 9th of February 1922, uh, 80 masked and armed men attacked the ropeway and cut it in several places. Um, now, neither the, the IRA nor the miners uh, were, in, were supporting this action. Um, it was down to the carters. The carters wanted to destroy something they regarded as undermining mining their future way of life. Um, in response, the IRA declared martial law uh, in the colliers. Uh, preventing movement between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. unless by permission of the battalion commandant or vice commandant. So in this case, the, the community was divided. Um, the livelihoods of the actual miners um, were under threat as the mines were closed for several months and they were forced to seek work on the roads and some went into the army uh, the now new Free State Army. Um, my father was one of these. He, with his brother and several other miners, joined the army in Kilkenny in June 1922, just before the outbreak break of civil war. Um, he changed sides later when he was posted um, to Tipperary and forced to fight uh, Republicans like Dan Breen and Danny, Denny Lacey and spent the rest of the war um, fighting alongside Dan Breen. However, the leadership uh, in the neighborhood in the main took the free state side in the civil war that followed. Okay. Thank, thank you, Anne. Um, interesting. Um... Uh, uh, interest, interesting uh, and uh, distinctive place, as I think we said at, at the outset, and uh, the insight into social uh, relations uh, is, um, is, 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 um, is very interesting altogether, as were the other insights uh, that we've had. Um, we are going um, over time, I think, at this stage, um, so I'm not going to be able to ask all the questions that I had intended uh, to ask. I see questions are coming in on the chat uh, from uh, uh, the distinguished Labour historian Emmett O'Connor, uh, from Michael Shandley, Pat McCarthy, Liam Alex Heffron, Johnny Burke, uh, and uh, Niall Murray. Uh, you can, um, if you can uh, watch their, um, the, the answers, um, uh, watch the discussion uh, there in the, um, in the Q&A if, if you want to. I don't have time to put those uh, questions uh, now. Uh, I do want to go for one final question uh, to Terry, if I uh, may. And I'd refer to something in asking this question, um, uh, Terry, uh, that's uh, mentioned in Peter Rigney's uh, pamphlet. Uh, he quotes Martin O'Sullivan, who was writing in uh, 1967, one of the railway workers in involved in the embargo, and he couldn't understand why, and I quote, these important events were not recorded in any recent history of Ireland. He was talking about uh, the significant uh, munitions boycott of, of 1920. And I suppose if we uh, think about the other uh, developments that were discussed tonight, um, again, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, I suppose the social tensions, the grievances, uh, that underpinned uh, the revolution. 
by and large, uh, we're not uh, much, uh, we haven't brought them much more to the fore, I think, during uh, the past um, number of years than uh, they were uh, in uh, 1967 when railway worker Martin O'Sullivan uh, was, was, uh, uh, was, was writing. Um, uh, so uh, Terry, uh, do, you, um, do you think that that's so? Um, or do you think uh, significant advances have been made in understanding uh, the kind of social uh, basis uh, for the developments of the period uh, that we're addressing or, um, or, 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 or otherwise? Yeah, well, the, the, the military image of uh, the revolution has loomed large um, for most of the 20th century and, and up to today. And I think that's part of the project of um, legitimizing the, um, the um, Irish state. Yeah. Um, and it's a question of like the victors write the history books and we, uh, we know that. But uh, we have to understand there's a historical context to how a society understands its past and we look at the, we look at the the, 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 the past from um, the present day and what, what, what speaks to the contemporary is what remembered uh, is what's remembered. Also the state plays a big role in this um, like in all kinds of ways but I mean we can look at today the Bureau of Military um, History witness statements are digitized yeah and now I'm not knocking that I mean it's great to have them but on the one hand you've got the Bureau of Military History um, statements digitized. And then you have the land commission records hidden away under lock and key. Yeah. So, I mean, the state creates the archive itself. And I think the, the, the juxtapos juxtaposition there, the discrepancy there, um, um, can speak to why we still have the military image of uh, the revolution as opposed to a more um, social um, image of the revolution. So, in all that, we do have limited agency. Yeah, uh, we have limited agency, but we do have agency and it's important to exercise it. Um, and there's things we can do as the, like the, 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 the publication being launched um, uh, this evening or the, the publication, um, John, that you mentioned that we're working on. Um, and I just want to finish up with, uh, with, uh, with just a few words about that. So that's going to be, we're working on a publication called The Spirit of Revolution it's going to be out, hopefully, um, no, I shouldn't say hopefully, it's going to be out in April 19, uh, uh, in April uh, 2022, and that's looking at a lot of these local case studies of the Irish Revolution um, from below, um, including what Anne and uh, Moira have been talking about, and the Galway Town Tenants League, agrarian mobilisations in County Galway, the Munster Soviets, an IRA company in Mayo, the Belfast Labour Party, um, lots of other contributions. I'm looking forward to it. And there is stuff, we can research history and preserve the memory of this past and create something of a history from below, even if we happen to be pushing against the grain. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Terry. And thanks to all the uh, panelists uh, this evening. Um, we can, um, I think, uh, the um, discussion uh, can finish at this point. I think it was wide ranging and very um, interesting with some, um, um, uh, 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 some provocative uh, points uh, raised. Um, but as I said at the outset, it is uh, May Day and we can't uh, let the occasion uh, pass uh, without a song. And um, France Devine's been waiting patiently there for the last um, uh, for the last hour, I think, ready to burst into song. So we can go over uh, to Francis uh, now. Carmarga, John, um, I hope the volume is okay. Um... And uh, I should say, uh, Francis is a distinguished uh, labour historian in his own right, uh, with many publications uh, to his credit. Uh, but of late, he's also uh, known as a singer. And uh, a second album, I think, was released fairly recently, or was it the second? Yeah, it was the second. Yeah, yeah. Uh, an ownerless corner of earth, and this particular song is on the on the CD. Uh, I'll just introduce it very briefly by saying it's written by Jim Connell, very appropriate for May Day. Jim Connell's most famous uh, song contribution was, of course, the Red Flag, 
and each May Day or May Day weekend, a, a memorial ceremony is now held in the monument to uh, Connell in Cross Akeel. This particular song appeared in Red Flag Rhymes, which was published uh, in 1900. Uh, it does give an air in the book, which is we'll never get drunk again, but I've never found anybody that knows the air. So the air that I'm going to sing it to is one I put on it, on it myself. And I'm going to dedicate uh, the song to not just Anne Boren, uh, but to George, who I worked with briefly, uh, to Nixie, of course, but also uh, as Castle Comber has been mentioned to the late Tom Ling. I'm Thank sure you. Agree. We, we owe a great deal to uh, uh, And Jimmy Welsh. Uh, good, Indeed. Uh, good comrade of mine. Never mind the Brennan Rose and, <laughs> and all the rest. So, so, Anne, this is for you. What makes the song particularly interesting is that it was written, as I say, in 19, or published in 1900, 12 years before the Miners' Next Step, the South West Miners' Federation syndicalist document calling for the nationalization of mines, uh, now a thing of the past, but uh, on May Day, it, uh, we should be considering state ownership and public ownership far more than we are in fighting back against privatization, etc. Mm -hmm. So here we go, the miners song. Thank you. Deep in the gloom of the great earth's womb, we force the birth of coal. The power that moves the nation's wheels and the furnace fires we roll. We dig out wealth at the cost of health, we build our oppression shrine. I be sold for a wage of woe till the miners own the mine. We move the ranks of the cogs and cranks that grind out food and clothes. We warm the walls of the festive halls when the wintry tempest blows. We cook the fare and we make the glare where lords and ladies dine. I be sold for a wage of woe till the miners own the mine. We furnish forth to the south and north the force that drives the mill. We make the snorting engine dash through forest, fen, and hill. We rush the lordly ocean crop across the bounding brine. I be sold for a wage of woe till the miners own the mine. We take the risk of the awful whisk when the rotten cable breaks. We pierce the deadly after damp when the shattered ceiling shakes. <clears throat> we search the wreck for a mangled mate and our health and life resign. Will I be sold for a wage of woe till the miners own the mine? But we see a light through the breaking night and a smiling dawn we'll greet. We'll toil no more in the planet's core for a crust and a winding sheet. We'll drive despair from the brightening air and our hands and hearts combine. We'll face our health to the commonwealth when the miners own the mine. Lovely. Thank, thank you very much uh, for, for that, Francis. And um, we'll have you back in one of these uh, panels one of the day in uh, your historian's um, uh, capacity. Um, so uh, we move to the final um, element of tonight's, um, uh, of tonight's May Day uh, event, and that's the launch of uh, Peter Rigney's uh, publication. We have um, here, just down the road in uh, Galway, uh, we have uh, 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 Tish Gibbons uh, to, uh, uh, to do the honours there. Um, Tish is um, an independent educator and researcher who was a long time uh, head of the SIPDU uh, College. Um, and she's uh, interested, uh, Dr. Gibbons is interested uh, in the history of industrial relations and in uh, labour history. Uh, generally, and uh, she's been a friend of the Irish Centre for the Histories of Labour and Class and uh, uh, done uh, uh, much uh, work with us over the last number of years. So I'll hand over to Tish. Thank you, John. Thanks a lot. 
Um, and thanks for the invitation to do the honours tonight. Uh, and thanks to the Irish Centre for the Histories of Labour and Class for uh, another fine event. Um, you have a track record now. Um, so I hope I can do some justice uh, to Peter's pamphlet, um, because I think it's, it's quite an important publication. Uh, and it's important for a number of reasons. Um, the, the, the recording of the history of working people is always important, whether it's the story of the struggle for decent working conditions and pay, or the fight for the right of trade unions to form and to function. Yet it's a history that's not always recorded adequately, and uh, that, that was mentioned earlier on tonight. And sometimes I think it's not recorded in a form accessible to those whose history it is. And we often complain that Irish history can focus too much or too often on the three P's, you know, the priest, the peasant and the patriot. And uh, Emmett O'Connor would advise us to also consider the effects of post-colonialism, I suppose, the fourth P. But it's also important, as Peter writes, that this decade of commemorations doesn't ignore the contribution of ordinary workers to those events which resulted in the foundation of the state. And finally, it's also important that those industrial actions which are politically motivated, which are not necessarily about any work related gain for those who are involved in, in such action, that those actions are recorded in that way too. Think of mandate members against apartheid, for example, and the important sustained action uh, recorded here in this publication. And so this pamphlet records an important part of both our political and our working people's trade union history. And I think it's really interesting to note that it's the result of a collaboration between a trade unionist, the employer historically involved in the dispute, and a not-for-profit publishing house with a unique focus on labour history, labour interests and social matters generally. And maybe that's what it takes um, uh, to do that. And so, 1920 and how railway men and dockers defied an empire. Um, Peter traces the story, and I know he's probably talked quite a bit about it already this evening, but just to say, you know, he traces the story from three separate partially linked episodes or subsequently linked episodes. Um, Ireland at the time had British troops aplenty stationed on the island and who were transported by train to wherever their deployment was needed. And that all changed on the 5th of May. And as a proud Mayo woman, I'm delighted to note that it was in County Mayo that this auspicious event happened um, at Castle Bar Station, to be precise. And there a large number of troops boarded a train bound for Westport. But the driver, one Harry Blaney, refused to start the train with the armed troops on board. And the other event, a few days later, British dockers refused to load the SS Jolly George at London docks. And it was there to be loaded with munitions to be sent to Poland for use against the Soviet Union. The Union official at the time, no less a man than Ernest Bevan, declared, whatever may be the merits or demerits of government in Russia, that is a matter for Russia, and we have no right to determine their form of government. And while the NUR, Peter makes the point at the time, might not have intended for this to apply to Ireland, Irish dockers, members of the ITGWU, some of them, thought otherwise, and on the 20th of May refused to unload a shipload of military equipment at the North Wall. There were guns on board meant for the DMP, the, the Dublin Metropolitan Police. The dockers were of the view that if British dockers refused to handle munitions for their troops to kill Russians, then why would they, Irish dockers, handle mun munitions for British forces to kill Irish people? And so it began. And Peter traces the story of those railway men and dockers, dedicated trade unionists, as they risked their lives and their livelihoods. And Peter makes the point a thousand of them did indeed lose their jobs, though uh, it's mostly reinstated afterwards. And along the way, Peter also includes the, you know, the expected internal union tensions, the surrounding political agitation, and plenty of local flavour is included. I know Galway and Mayo were virtually isolated by July. Sounds a bit like current restrictions, maybe. But anyway, and also included are some really interesting copies of original union correspondence, maps and other records of the time. Uh, so I, I think now we should probably hand you back to Peter himself, uh, Dr. Peter Rigney. 
He hardly needs any introduction to many of you here uh, from his previous publications and labour history related presentations, but also because of his years working with the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, where, as many of you know, he was not only interested in Irish railway history, but also he was the ICTU Group Secretary for the Group of Unions at Iron Road Iron, and possibly its predecessor, CIE, Peter, I'm not sure. So anyway, a practical as well as an historical interest in the question. And railways were a focus also of his PhD, which he started in 2000. Though the original interest in this particular story dates back to his undergraduate days, which he admits was only 40 years ago. Well, Peter, I'm glad you didn't waste any time telling the tale, you know, but um, anyway, seriously, I know that you uh, took advantage of retirement and the pandemic and the fact that you retained the keys to the archive uh, to bring this to us now at such an appropriate time. Um, and so over to you now, you can have the last word and thank you very much. Thanks, Tish. Uh, you want thank to you, Tish. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, firstly, I, I suppose the first people to thank would be Jane Cregan of Corporate Communications and Irish Rail, who supported this project as part of the decade of commemorations. And I think Irish Rail being the only state body who, who was in, in existence in 1920. And it always struck me when I started my researches in this in, in, as an undergraduate um, as to why the munitions strike was never covered. And I remember speaking to some uh, retired locomotive drivers and one of them, who was actually a branch secretary of the Drivers' Union in Athlone and wrote some historical articles for the Rail Record Society, he said, I should have talked to my father about that, but I never did. And it goes back to what Martin O'Sullivan wrote in The Irish Independent. This is one of the big surprises of the book where I would be praising The Irish Independent. But they did actually break the story. In 1967, they put the question out here, why was this never touched? And then an Englishman, Charles Townsend, raised it again in 1979. Why was this never touched? And it was next raised again in 1974, sorry, raised before in 74 by an American, Arthur Mitchell. And I think, and I can only speculate as a result, is the people who wrote the history were the people that carried the guns. No disrespect to them, but they're the people who wrote the histories or got them published. And I was looking today in um, Ernie, Ernie O'Malley's books, either The Singing Flame, or uh, on another man's wound. And he makes a point there, on, uh, and it, I think it was on another man's wound, which he wrote when he was in America in the 30s, that there was an awful lot done by the trade unions for the national struggle, but the IRA didn't, didn't respond and didn't sympathize. Um, so writing a book during COVID, as I say, well, launching a book during COVID when all the bookshops are closed is interesting. Researching it is even more interesting and thankfully, the Rail Record Society archives was within, within five kilometres of my home. And when I was stopped by the guards on my way, I had a letter to brandish that I had a, an important duty to check the humidity of the archives. This made it possible, combined with the tremendous online resources of military archives. The one thing you do if you give the stuff to an army, they do it thoroughly and they roll it out and they've, they've done us credit. Also, importantly, is the, is the existence of the provincial press online the existence of the British cabinet minister in the British National Archives. It's just a pity that the material on the Doyle Airden files, which were digitised in Digital Repository Ireland over two years ago, haven't yet made it into the National Archives of Ireland website. But I hope you'll enjoy the book. I hope you'll take advantage of the current opening of essentials, non-essential retail to go out and buy it in the bookshop. While we still have time to buy stuff other than what Amazon wants us to read. Or if you don't like it, you can buy it from Umiskin online. And thanks is due to uh, Jack Beginley for his support in it, or also the website of the Railway Preservation Society of Ireland. So like most um, authors at launches, but unfortunately without the presence of cheap red wine and canaps, I say go out and read and buy the book. Okay. Thank you, Tish. Thanks, uh, Peter. And uh, so you can go on the Umiskin uh, web page in order to order the yep. book, uh, which will be delivered to you, post and package included, uh, for nine euro. Is that right? Um, I'm not sure of the price. I, yeah. I know it retails. Um, it retails for six euros or five sterling. 
Yes, and it's, it's, in, okay. it's on Umiskin and it's in places like Connolly Books, Alan Hannes, or the Cultural and Bookshop in Belfast. Yeah, yeah. So six euro if you can uh, visit a bookshop. If you can find or, a bookshop. Uh, nine nine if you want to, uh, if you want to get it in online. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so get on to Umiskin Press and the Railway Record Society um, uh, for your copy. Okay, I can. Um, bring things to a conclusion here. Um, thanks to all the panelists, all the contributors, uh, musical and, um, and vocal uh, uh, over the last uh, uh, 90 minutes. And thanks uh, to the Moore Institute, uh, to Dan uh, for uh, facilitating, uh, for, for, for giving us the platforms essentially uh, to do this. Uh, so uh, to uh, Peter, to Terry, uh, to Anne, uh, to Moira, our panelists, uh, to um, uh, to Tish, um, and 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 to Francis. Uh, thank you all uh, very much. Uh, to our audience out there uh, and our future audiences, uh, because uh, this will uh, remain on Facebook and it will go up on um, YouTube on the Moore Institute's um, um, uh, 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 pages uh, in 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 the next few days. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, good night and uh, thanks to everybody. Thank you.